welcome, 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 and happy birthday, New Hope. Happy anniversary to us. Today we are celebrating the last Sunday after Epiphany, also Transfiguration of our Lord, and New Hope's 41st anniversary. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the hymn that the choir just sang for the uh, offertory, I mean for the opening. It was written by a pastor's wife. This simple hymn was written July the 29th, 1989, on the eve of the groundbreaking celebration of New Hope Moravian Church here. And it was written by Artis Weber, and she's an accomplished vocalist, musician, and hymn writer who has done extensive work with many Moravian, with early Moravian music. She and her husband, the late Herbert Weber, have been long-loving friends and supporters of our congregation and our music program. Herbert, her husband, was called to serve as New Hope's interim pastor twice in our early years. The first time was in 1989 and again in 1995. It was during the Reverend Weber's first interim that artist, his wife, wrote on this ground, July the 29th, 1989, to commemorate our groundbreaking. What a wonderful, wonderful song. And the words in it are so filled with our mission, New Hope's mission. So we are so glad to have you here to worship with us today. I hope I don't embarrass them, but happy birthday, not happy birthday, but welcome to Stan and Judy King from Ohio. We do appreciate your coming and being with the Greasers and worshiping with us today. We're so thankful that you are here for our love feast. There are some items that are coming up this coming week. Tuesday the 13th is Shrove Tuesday, and we have got bacon and, and sausage, and, and we're having blueberry syrup, thanks to Mark and Melissa and some apple syrup, and so please plan to come. It's from 5 to 7. Love to have you come and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun with a lot of gaiety for Shrove Tuesday. Then, the next day, which is Valentine's Day, but it is also our Ash Wednesday, and we will be having our Ash Wednesday service at 6.30 with communion. Then following the next Sunday will be our first Sunday in Lent, and all of our parents and everything will turn purple, and we will be celebrating the first Sunday in Lent with Holy Communion. So we ask you to take note of all these dates on your calendar, and please plan to attend. Out front, you might see some photo albums, thanks to Melissa, who worked diligently and got some our historical pieces out. Please take time to just glance and see where New Hope was and where New Hope is now and the growth that we have had. It's, it's remarkable. So thank you, Melissa. Also, the flowers are given to the glory of God. He is our rock, as Phyllis played on the, uh, on the offertory. But Pastor Daddy, they're a gift to you from our congregation for your years of leadership, and we want you to continue to lead us. But, but we do appreciate all that you are doing with keeping New Hope strong and moving forward, so thank you. Thank you. Thank You're so welcome. Well, let's move on to our prayer concerns. I do have a prayer concern. This is concerning Matt Wall. Matt has had, had last surgery yesterday for his leg injury. He will likely be transferred to a Winston-Salem rehab facility by the end of this week and the long recovery is ahead. Almond and Ann and their family are very grateful for the prayers. And as you know, Matt was in a trail motorbike accident where he broke his legs, his feet, and his wrist, and he's a nephew of Ann and Almond. So we're all lifting him up and the family in prayer. You'll feel that prayer. It, God is there. We also want to pray for the people of Israel. And there are many others listed on our prayer list, so let's be sure and keep them in mind when we pray daily for members of our congregation and for loved ones. May we go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Lord, 
just thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful celebration we have today of 41 years of new hope. Lord, we ask that you continue to lead this congregation, that we may do your will in everything that we do. May we reach out to the community and support them and love them. And through what we do, may they feel your love. Lord, we ask the special prayer for those that are ill, those that are recovering from accidents, those that are recovering from surgery, those that are facing disease. Lord, we ask that they feel your presence and your strength with them and with their families. Lord, we thank you for this day, and Lord Jesus, you are our rock, and we are so blessed to have you as our Lord and our Savior. In your holy name we pray, amen. Now, would you all please stand and join with me the first hymn in your love bestowed. Lord Jesus, for our call of grace to praise your name in fellowship, we humbly meet before your face and in your presence, love feast keep. Please stand. <laughs> Scripture will be read um, after the love feast and after our offering. We will now have our love feast served to us. What brought us together, what joined our hearts, that part in which Jesus, our high priest, imparts, tis this which cements the disciples of Christ, who are into one by the Spirit baptized.
us now say our Moravian blessing together. Come, Lord Jesus, our guest to be, and bless these gifts bestowed by thee. Bless thy dear ones everywhere, and keep them in thy loving care. Amen. Here in this earth, we 
are collected, let us sing together. Tis a pleasant thing to see. Brothers in the Lord agree, sisters of a God of love, live as they shall live above, acting each a Christian part, one in word and one in heart.
As you entered worship this morning, you had the opportunity to give of your tithes and your offerings. Always remember that it is to God that we give our praises, our prayers, and our gifts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and almighty God, you are the God of abundance. And Lord, you bless your people in so many ways. So Lord, today we are grateful that we have gathered in your house. And Lord, that we have to give so that others might hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray today that you will bless the giver. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now transition into the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Today our scripture text will come from 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 12, Psalms 50, 1 through 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6, and the Gospel of Mark, Mark 9, 2 through 9. Hear now the holy word of God. From Psalm 50. The Lord the Mighty One is God, and he has spoken. 
He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God, God shines in glorious radiance. God, our God approaches, and he is not silent. Fire devours everything in his way, and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and the earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. For Second Corinthians. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is in the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for God's sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From Mark. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, <clears throat> Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. May God bless the reading of his holy word today, and may he give to each one of us clear understanding. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O oh God, in the transfiguration of your Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the very witnesses of Moses and Elijah and the voice from the bright cloud you foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us, Lord, to be faithful, bright, shining lights in a dark world. Help us as your people, Lord, to listen. Lord, I thank you this day for my voice. I pray that you give me clarity. I will step aside. Bless the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts that they may be a profit to us and acceptable and pleasing to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today, once again, we stand at the cusp of a change in the church season. Transfiguration is the last Sunday after Epiphany. It takes us from the ordinary time of Epiphany to Ash Wednesday. This year we celebrate Transfiguration and New Hope's anniversary, 41 years. Like Jesus' Transfiguration, New Hope's 41st anniversary is a celebratory time for us as God's people. Today in the Gospel of Mark, at first, Peter, James, and John look out, and they're going with Jesus, and they're hiking up a mountain. Much like we might do when we would go to Laurel Ridge, they're hiking up a high mountain. And it's sort of a place that's kind of like eager hikers would want to go, and they yearn to scale and go even higher. The higher, the better. But then quickly everything changes. 
But really, isn't that the way life is? We have a plan, and we think this is the way it's going to go, and then life can change so quickly. Suddenly, Jesus' disciples see Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth. He's covered in a bright light. I think it's important that we understand that Jesus' transfiguration does not transfer or alter him and seeing him in his inward, but on the outward. This is what the, the uh, disciples were seeing. They were seeing an outward transfiguration. They were seeing something that they had never seen before. And here, all of a sudden, here's Moses and Elijah. Now think about this. You've gone up the mountain, and then Jesus is transformed. Here's this big, bright light. Here's Moses and Elijah. I mean, that was not what you expect when you were walking up the mountain, right? Nor was it what the disciples expected. And when we think about it, you know, it was something that the disciples really couldn't hardly believe it. And if we think about it, could we have believed this was happening before our very eyes? In a sense, Jesus' transformation, Jesus transforms and he removes that veil from our eyes that we're able to see, that we're able to know who he is and receive him. First, 2 Corinthians 3.18 reminds us, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being changed. Do you hear me say that? We're being changed from glory to glory. We're not there yet. But God is transforming us every day. And you know, in our text today, when God removes the veil of Jesus, it was his humanness that was He was human. And yet, this veil of Jesus' humanness reveals his divine nature. Think about that. It's really wondrous, and it's powerful. And it was one of the things that before the disciples, as I said earlier, they had never experienced anything like this before. They had seen Jesus feed 5,000 and 4,000. They had seen him heal people. But they'd never seen a transformation like this. And they looked to him as the Messiah, and they believed that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior. But then all of a sudden, what is going on here? Here's this bright light, and he is totally transformed before their very eyes. Jesus' external appearance was utterly changed, and the glow was so bright. Some biblical scholars say that they couldn't even look upon him. The light was so bright. Perhaps they felt a lot like Moses felt. The burning bush experience, for example. We know about that. The bush burned, but it never burned up. And we think about reflective of Elisha. And remember, he had prayed and hoped to receive from God on the altar, on the altar drenched in water to win the wager against the prophets of Baal. When we think about this, and we think about Jesus' transformation there, and here are Moses and Elisha. Not something that they had anticipated seeing as they hiked up the mountain. And then there's a cloud that appears, and it manifests the divine with a voice. And the voice does not speak in the second person. We 
remember in Jesus' baptism, when Jesus spoke, when, when God spoke. But this voice is different. Remember, God spoke, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. But this voice speaks in the third person. This is my dearly beloved son. My dearly loved son. Listen to him. Think about that. When someone's talking to you and they're saying, okay, now listen up. Pay attention. This is important. I can remember when I was in seminary and if the professor said, okay, pay attention to this. This is important. It's going to be on the exam. You're going to listen, right? Because you want to be sure you know what's going to be on that exam. Well, there's several aspects of the uh, transfiguration that I believe that demonstrate Christ is the Messiah. But he's also God. 1 John 1, 5 says God is light. Jesus' face glowed like the sun. Secondly, the Father bears witness with his voice. And it's regarding his son. He says, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. The transfiguration declares Christ's divine sonship and foreshadows what's to come in the future. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And the Holy Trinity is manifested during this. We hear the Father's voice. Jesus is transfigured. And the moving of the Holy Spirit and the dazzling glow that we see. Transfiguration in the Greek is metamorpha, to be transformed. You know, I think it's important, and it would be hard for us to appreciate all of the transfiguration if we don't figure in, Jesus had begun to prepare his disciples. Remember, he had begun to tell them that he was going to suffer, that he was going to die, that he was going to be resurrected. But clearly, they didn't understand. How many times do you hear things in Scripture and you really don't quite understand it? Believe me, as I study and study, and we talk about this some in Sunday school, the more you study, the more you want to study. Because it's like it opens up another door. It opens up another little nugget of God's Word. And you want to understand it. And you just want to grasp it. In Matthew 16, 21 through 23, Jesus told his disciples, and he predicts his death. Scripture states, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not of God's. Well, most scholars, Bible scholars, believe that during Jesus' time and about when we're thinking about the transfiguration, it was about three years into the three and a half year ministry when Jesus had began his ministry, when he was doing his ministry, he would, 
he had um, cho was choosing his disciples, and he was they were with him month in and month out, year after year. And they had been seeing Jesus do miracles, but they had also began to do miracles too. And they were spreading the word. And so Jesus, I believe, took them to this high mountain so that they would see his glory. And they would have no question, without a doubt, that he was the Messiah. He was the Savior. And then think about it, to hear this voice, this loud voice. And as I thought about this, I could, I could just hear it like it was echoing. This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. And then as they start to head back down the mountain, they've experienced this, something that they cannot put into words. How are they going to go back and tell people what they've seen? Nobody's going to believe them. They think they'll think they've had a mental breakdown. Nobody's going to believe this. And yet I want to draw your attention to something. They were excited and all the things that were going on. And I have to wonder, you know, sometimes in our excitement, you remember Peter wanted to build tents and be there and have them a place to stay there. But that wasn't the plan. They were going to come back down the mountain. Well, we all know what it's like. You can be on a mountaintop experience and Steve can attest to this when you go to Emmaus. You can be on a mountaintop experience, but I can tell you, be prepared, because when you start coming back that mountain, down the mountain, and you get into the real world, the world that's around you, you're probably going to have some things that are happening, maybe things you haven't thought about. And you're going to be changed because you've been up on the mountain. But yet the things down in the, down in the valley probably haven't changed that much. Well, one thing I want to draw your attention to, and I think that this is something that a lot of people don't notice. You'll notice today in Mark's text, the voice in the cloud was directed at the disciples rather than the Son. And this voice speaks of Jesus' divine identity, who he is, and when we think about it, I want to draw your attention to Mark 9.9. 9. Scripture says, As they went back down the mountain, he, Jesus, told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. I think many people miss this. And I'll rephrase it. In essence, Jesus is saying, don't tell until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Until I have risen from the dead, don't tell. Think about that. Now, how could you possibly not tell something like this? You really wouldn't want to, but you'd probably slip up and tell it. Because in your excitement, you would want to tell it. This really stood out to me in a sense until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Jesus' divine nature is also referenced in the Apostle Paul's message to Philippi. Here's what scripture says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, 
He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. To He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Everything that Jesus did was to bring glory to God the Father. He lived his life obedient. He lived a sinless life. And all that he said that would happen, happened. It came to pass. And many times when we have things that happen, and it's hard for us to listen, because I believe that God still speaks to his people, and he directs our pathway. But many times we so stubbornly want to go our own way. And really, I can tell you from past experience, if you try to go, you're going to be miserable. You got to go the way of the cross, and you got to keep him at, at your key element. The purpose of your life would be Jesus Christ. I'll close with Jesus' words to us in John ten, fourteen and sixteen b. Jesus says, "I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep." And my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give life, I give my life for the sheep. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. would tell us today that we must listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd. We must listen when God speaks to us and hear that voice, that still, small voice when he speaks and directs our paths. Listen to him. Listen to him. God of glory and mercy. Jesus experienced a shameful death. And yet we hear today that your beloved son went to a high mountain and you revealed his life and glory. Help us, Lord, to face our lives. And help us to go forward in purpose for you. Speak to us, Lord. We are listening. Clear away the confusion of our life. Speak your power and your strength and your peace to us and upon us. Lord, bless this New Hope congregation as it seeks to obey your will and your purpose for this, your church. Strengthen each one of us, Lord that we might be agents of your truth and instruments of your peace. Be with us, Lord. Speak to us. We are listening. 
Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please stand for our closing hymn. Sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. You'll find it in the hymn. Sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. Sing with a cheerful voice. Exalt our God with one accord and in his name rejoice. Near cease to sing, O ransom host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Until in realms of endless light, your praises shall unite. in your life. He is the Holy One who calls you by name. May God bless you and keep you both now and forevermore. Amen. Gracious, gracious.